something I've been doing every year now, we, we do what we call the American Energy Tour. And each year we take a few members of Congress out to a deep water rig in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we just had that, uh, that tour about a week and a half ago, went to a, a rig that uh, that's operating about 60 miles south of the Port Fouchon in the Gulf. And they, they drill about 4,000 feet deep to, uh, to go into some of these just massive reservoirs and finds that we found in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, the, the one that they're looking at right now, they were actually drilling in the process of drilling. Uh, they'll probably go not only 4,000 feet deep, below the, uh, the the surface, but they'll, they'll go another 30,000 feet or so to get to the, uh, to the reservoir where there's oil. And if, and if you spend your, your couple of billion dollars of private money to go and, and finally actually find a big find of oil, uh, then you're going to still have to spend probably another $4 billion to extract it. And at some point, years and years down the road, you'll make a profit, and that's when President Obama will target you as the enemy and come after you. So <laughs> you wonder why, uh, you know, why it's such a challenge to produce energy in America with these policies. But, uh, but it's really good to get members out that have never been to see a, uh, a deep water rig and how just the technology that's involved, the skills that are involved. And these are great, high paying jobs. The rig we were on, that rig alone, there's probably 120 to 150 people living and working on that rig every day. It costs about a million dollars a day to run the, the operation. There's probably about a thousand American jobs tied to it. And the average pay is well over $60,000 a year. You can leave high school. You can leave high school and be making $50,000 a year with great career opportunities. There are people working on that rig making six figures. Uh, and so again, this is a, you know, it's a great American success story. We're seeing in the shale plays across the country and the deep waters of the Gulf. And, and unfortunately, the biggest impediment they face is, is federal policy. And, and, Unfortunately, a lot of it coming from this administration. So, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that. I know we're right in the middle of sequestration, and you know, tomorrow they're going to have what's called snowquestration. Now, <laughs> there's a global warming hearing I've heard that's going to be held in the Senate side tomorrow. That you know, I, I do say God has a sense of humor, and Al Gore, Al Gore's actually been snowed out twice now for years. <laughs> so, uh, you know, take that however you will. You know, I don't want to get political about this issue. That's the last thing I'm going to do. But I, um, I, I will say that you know, in the RSC, and I'm glad we got. Uh, a few of my colleagues, and you'll hear from each of them uh, today, too. I'm sure each will have their own take. But uh, the fact that, you know, all of these threats for the last couple of weeks, the president's flying all around the country on Air Force One with a scare tour telling everybody that, you know, every food inspector is going to be laid off, but we can't cut the $26 billion in fraud that we know about in the food stamp program. It's only the meat inspectors that get shut off. Every school teacher and firefighter and you know, we've been combing through the, uh, the the law books to figure out where the president hires and fires school teachers and police officers. But I do think you know, that was a joke too, because we don't. But, um, but they don't know that because they all think they're going to get laid off. And uh, you know, and so you know, all the TSA. So yesterday I go to the airport to fly back to uh, to DC, and literally it was probably the shortest wait I've had in uh, in, in months. And, and maybe it's because the president just scared everybody away from flying because you thought there'd be three hour waits at the airport. It was literally like five minute uh, wait and you know you talk to some of these TSA agents I mean these are all, these are all people that have jobs and they you know they don't know what to expect from the president but when the when the jet when the, the head of the architect of the Capitol has to correct a misstatement by the president about janitors uh, being being fired he cuts and pay and, and he has to say it as politely as he can and he says a high level official in government said this but it's not true <laughs> And so the media has actually started to kind of make fun of the fact that the president really saying a lot of things that are just not true. And, and, it, and it reached a crescendo Saturday Night Live, you know, which, which if you're a Republican, you know, if you do everything right on a good day, they'll still figure out a way to make fun of you on Saturday Night Live. The lead off on Saturday Night Live, if you didn't see it, you got to go Google it, it's online. Uh, they actually, they, they not only made fun of the president's claims, you know, and it starts off with him threatening all of these people, but then they literally, he's like, okay, you know, and then there's going to be a construction worker, and he brings out a construction worker, and by the third person you realize, he's bringing out the village people, the man. <laughs> <laughs> no man, there's no need to do that. And then they all start doing the song, and it's just, you know, that, that's when you know the president has jumped the shark. <laughs> For once, Republicans are actually pushing conservative policy and, and getting it implemented into law, despite a president trying to do everything he can with the bully pulpit to block it. So I think I think we're at a point now where we, we finally shifted the debate, and, and, and it's important for us now uh, to not overplay our hand because when Barack Obama. Can
taken over play his hand and shows you there's a limit where the, the American public say, wait a minute, you're not being serious. We, we want to have an honest conversation. And that's what we've been trying to do for a few years now. And I think we're finally having that conversation about spending and borrowing. And if you look at jobs in the economy and the things that we've been focusing on to get control over spending, uh, when, when the president just every single day now, he gets his tax hikes and the fiscal cliff, and then as soon as this deal comes along and Bob Woodward points out that this was the president's deal, and then they basically try to go wage a war with Bob Woodward and, you know, really smart, anybody that's read history, last president that, that actually targeted Bob Woodward it didn't end up real well for that president. So anyway, they're, they're now waging a war on, on Bob Woodward. So, um, you know, but... But then it's all about, you know, now we got to raise taxes, and so it keeps moving the goalposts. Uh, but if you look at tax revenue, tax revenues, collections to the government, uh, have never been higher in the history of our country. This is the highest amount of money the federal government's uh, taken in, and, and yet the president still wants more tax increases, uh, and it just shows that he's not serious about addressing the problem of spending. So we're going to stay focused on what the real problem is, uh, both short term is getting spending under control, uh, but both short term and long term is, is getting uh, getting not only spending under control, but getting the economy back on track, getting economic growth. And, and the things that we all believe in, conservative policy, is actually policy that's good for our country. And, and energy is a good place to start because, you know, for, for Billy and I, those of us, Bill, I think Flory's over here, he, you know, he understands this industry better than anybody. More jobs will be created. If, if he just says yes to Keystone Pipeline, you know, 20 to 25,000 new jobs, billions of private investment, uh, the Outer Continental Shelf, um, Morgan Griffiths is one of the members that came down with me. You know, in Virginia, they actually want to explore for energy off the coast of Virginia. And, and, and by the way, the revenue sharing that goes with it, the things that we do in Louisiana with the revenue that we'll finally start getting in 2017, we're going to use that to restore our coast, to actually uh, you know, repair damage and, and kind of rebuild our infrastructure with the monies that we would be getting. But the federal treasury is going to be getting billions of dollars from that and the thousands and ultimately millions of good American jobs, you know, just like those young men and women that we met out on that rig that are making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year providing for their family. Producing energy in America. Energy we don't have to get from Middle Eastern countries that don't like us. So there's so much good about energy, what it means for uh, not only for jobs, but also what it means for national security. So we're going to continue to promote it on all of these fronts, what we were talking about. So uh, I'm real excited to have my other colleagues from the RSC that are here uh, to share with you some of this too, and then to be able to take some comments. So uh, next up, um, you know, as I gave the plug to Bill Flores, uh, somebody who actually worked in the energy industry can probably give us some uh, some good insights as well. But uh, we're glad to be with you. Thank you all for having us. And now I'll bring up Bill. Well, good morning. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. I've got an introduction I'd like to make. Jeff Morehouse, stand up. That's my chief of staff. So if uh, anything that I say that's offensive, call Jeff. So, anyway, uh, one of the things I want to let you know, uh, Steve touched on a little bit about my background. The last thing I ever thought I would do was be here in Congress. But when Cap and Trade passed the House of Representatives in the summer of 2009, I said, somebody's got to stop this madness. And, Running for city council wasn't going to do it. Up, up until that time, I'd all, all I had ever done in the political environment was to write big checks. And so I decided to go get big checks. <laughs> and uh, so I ran for Congress, and I defeated Chet Edwards. And, uh, you know, there, you know, I mean, you know, speaking of Chet, there were a couple of guys that hugged me on the elevator after they found out I beat Chet. I thought, this is a little weird. <laughs> And even, let me tell you a little bit about Texas 17. First of all, let me, I want to let you know, I, uh, I used to operate in uh, Steve's district. Uh, so we had, a, when I was in the uh, real world, I ran a company, founded and ran a company called Phoenix Exploration. And we, uh, we grew from a, a blank sheet of paper to $150 million in revenues in two years. And we would spend $100 to $125 million a year, uh, dollars a year to invest in American oil and gas. We had about 50 employees. We had a payroll of about six billion dollars, which was, if you do the math, that's about 120 thousand dollars a job. That's how you create a middle class in America. Now, my campaign consultant said, "Don't ever use that analogy again. That's too much money." But uh, <laughs> anyway, the uh, one of the show, I, I know how to sign the front side of a paycheck. Having helped create over 500 jobs in this country, it's it's. Uh, I come to Congress with a little bit of a different viewpoint. There are actually only two of us in Congress today that have any direct experience in oil and gas. That's Mike Conway from West Texas and me. 
A little bit about Texas 17, I always introduce it as the jock history. We've got two Heismans in a row and two national championship women's basketball teams in a row. Don't I look like I should represent them? <laughs> in any event, uh, the, the primary communities include Waco, Bryan College Station, and somehow wind up with North Austin. Now, I'm not sure how that fits together. But I have it, I'm happy to represent it. Uh, it uh, it's, a, it's a great district. The, uh, when you look at the primary issues today, <coughs> You know, and you think about the way President Obama's been talking with the American people, the primary issues are jobs and economy. We still have struggles there. Uh, the next issue is spending, deficits, and federal debt. We've got issues there, as you're well aware. American energy security, we've got, you know, the world is our, we've got a lot of potential there, which we're not adequately addressing. And then we've got, you know, less, to a lesser extent, government accountability and efficiency. But what are we talking about? We're talking about sequestration, guns, gay marriage, contraceptives. We're talking about uh, immigration, which we need to talk about somewhere down the road. We're talking about climate change in a CR. And what I'm hoping we can do, my goal in, in terms of being a member of Congress, is to try to keep us back on the big issues, jobs, economy, the deficits, and American energy. Uh, and so we're not going to be terribly successful in getting a lot of our agenda past, uh, at least for the next couple of years and maybe for the, the two years after that, but we can still try. We can still be talking about these big issues, these big visions. As a member of the Budget Committee, we're going to roll a budget out for the American people to look at in the next couple of weeks. It's going to show a path to balance in 10 years. And I'm hoping that we can stay focused on that and, and quit letting the, the President change the channels on us. Because every time we start trying to talk about the big issues, the President's trying to change the channel to talk about guns trying to talk about gay marriage or whatever. You know, I've got no problem talking about those things, but it takes us all the message that we as Republicans, I think, need to stay very focused on what the American people want to talk about. Eighty percent of Americans think that we spend too much money, that the federal government is wasteful. So we need to stay. That's a winning message for us. We'll just stay on it. Quit getting in arguments about guns and immigration things like that. Work on it, but don't get in arguments about it. And, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll do better. And American energy security is a great area for us to talk about all of those things. Like, if you want to fix the economy, start producing more American energy. It raises taxes. I mean, it, it puts people to work. It, it, it uh, produces great salaries, as Steve just talked about a few minutes ago. It also closes a deficit because it produces more revenue to the federal government. So why don't we, you know, we can talk about things like that. It produces a better national security situation. Just think about it. We imported zero barrels from the Middle East. All we'd really need to worry about in the Middle East is Israel, if you think about it. Now, that may be a, you know, but if, if you're starving all those countries around them because you're not buying their oil, Israel suddenly, you know, its, it's security situation should maybe get a little bit calmer, subject to what Iran wants to do. Um, when I got elected, I came up here and I was, uh, I won't use the majority of terms, but I was, re I was ambitious and ready to go to work and try to uh, uh, stop the damage and begin to repair work. And I think, practically speaking, we're just going to wind up being a firewall for the next two years and hopeful that we don't suffer any political losses in the 2014 race. In other words, stop the bad damage. Don't let any more Obamacare's pass. Don't let any more cap and trades pass. Uh, don't let any more attempts at, at uh, Dodd-Frank pass. Uh, we can have some tactical victories here and there. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the administration has an executive order called Ocean Marine Spatial Planning, zoning the ocean for short. Uh, we've been able to, to beat, to stop him from being able to fully execute that program. Uh, Congress looked at doing this for eight years. Congress never did pass it, so it's con congressional intent to not have this become law. The president's decided to do it. Well, you know, we, we've been successful in getting limitation amendments and appropriations bills to stop it. Uh, in the Sandy Bill, he had $150 million in that to implement this policy. We got that stripped out. That was the largest single line item taken out of the Sandy Relief Bill. The money was not the issue. The policy was the issue. Uh, but so, we, I mean, we're, we're, we as uh, members of, of the House, I think, we're always going to have to be looking for examples of sort of laser targets that we can go and we can just we can excise that. Uh, from the government's overreach uh, that it does. Uh, but that said, we still need to be talking about the, the big issues as we go forward. Um, one of the things I tell, you know, the, the president's talking about all these folks that are going to get laid off, uh, and he, he wants to put uh, government waste in 
front of, of workers. And I think we need, we need to be clear on that and always come back to the core issue is, is that you've got these wasteful programs of the federal government that, uh, that uh, he continues to think we need to raise more taxes so that we can fund those wasteful programs. And he's willing to cut the core of our government functions to do that. It'll be interesting tomorrow when we have the snow quester come up because invariably you're going to have a lot of non-essential government workers be told to stay home, but the government's going to work. And so I think it could give us, it could give us a great example, a great opportunity, Mar, to say, why aren't we going after that type of government worker instead of the TSA and our military They're not sending carriers to the Middle East? Why, why aren't we talking about those types of things? That'll be interesting. Next person I'm going to bring up is uh, somebody who uh, you mentioned the, uh, the Restore Act earlier and somebody who was instrumental in helping us get the House version of the Restore Act, which I think was much more uh, focused on letting the states do the things that they know how to do best. Uh, you know, in our case in Louisiana, to restore the damage that was done to our marshes and, and our coast from the, uh, the BP disaster, but there were five states impacted. And, uh, the go-to guy in Florida was Steve Sutherland. And uh, somebody, if you all know Steve, he's a passionate, passionate guy about a lot of things, but uh, he is, he's been somebody that's been uh, a great friend of mine, somebody I've enjoyed getting to know even more, and the more you get to know him, you realize uh, these are the kind of people that uh, made that class in 2010 so special. So we'll let that bring up Steve Sutherland. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate uh, your kind words and, and um, <clears throat> really looking forward to, to Steve's leadership uh, as chairman of the RSC. Um, Steve is, uh, one thing I've learned about Steve, I was telling our staff the other day that um, uh, Steve gets a lot of things done in a hurry. <clears throat> we had a meeting the other day in his office and, and I was very impressed with the way his staff uh, operates. And, and in this role, uh, really to carry the banner uh, of our conservative values uh, at, a, at the conference, um, he's got a lot to do. So uh, I appreciate, uh, Steve, your kind words and your work on the Restore Act. Uh, if you're familiar with the Restore Act, you'll know how important really that is uh, to, uh, to our region. And some of the things that uh, occurred in the Restore Act, the working together uh, between our delegation along the Gulf Coast, uh, it's really going to help us, I think, even going forward with some other issues you know, our seafood issues, our disaster preparedness, energy, a lot of things we do down along the Gulf Coast that I think uh, the Restore Act is going to help us uh, work together going forward. <clears throat> as far as a little bit about me, um, and first of all, let me say uh, to the Ribbon Society, thank you very much for this opportunity to come. And this is the first chance I've had to uh, have exposure to you, and I thank you for what you do. It's an honor to, uh, uh, to be here today because I think that I represent um, the things that you represent. I had never served uh, in an elected office before, uh, and my story is very similar to, to Bill's. Uh, uh, while he was uh, you know, developing a, a burden for where we were um, three years ago in Texas, uh, that same burden uh, was developing in, uh, I know, my heart, and also in Mississippi, and, and in Missouri, and, and um, uh, just around the country, all of us were, were concerned about the direction our country was going. Uh, I was running our family uh, three-generation business, uh, where we uh, uh, really continue the legacy of my father and my grandfather. Uh, we sweat <clears throat> payrolls, just as Bill alluded to. We sign paychecks, uh, and we know what it's like to pay all of our people and not have enough money left over to pay our family. That's the benefit of ownership. Okay? <clears throat> so you walk the floor on Thursday night, pray God, you know, bring in payroll. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> And it, it, it's amazing that uh, we've never missed a payroll in uh, those 60 years of doing business. But, but uh, just the, the struggles and the challenges uh, of small businesses around the country. And small businesses are such a key, uh, really, to the rhythm of America. I mean, we are a part of every Main Street uh, around this great country. Uh, we are the, the, the small businesses uh, hire more people, uh, create more for uh, the, the economies of our communities, uh, send more young people to uh, Little League baseball tournaments and soccer tournaments and uh, make more donations to uh, Red Cross and uh, United Way uh, than, than, than any other um, entities in this country. So I, <clears throat> I did something very similar to what Bill did. I got aggravated and, and um, we ran against a seven-term congressman, uh, Alan Boyd. Uh, and uh, because Alan was, was, was saying he was one thing in our district and doing something very different here in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and, and the policies uh, of the 111th Congress, uh, I think, will take us generations to overcome. 
So uh, we ran, we won, and um, uh, and we're here. And I will tell you uh, that, that I was asked a few minutes ago, you know, what is what is the thing I enjoy most about uh, being a member of Congress? It's the people. I don't like the schedule. I don't like being away from my wife, Susan, uh, who I started first grade with. Uh, we've been married 26 years. Uh, we have four daughters, um, Samantha, Stephanie, Allie, and Abby. So I live in a house of uh, five women. <laughs> to actually be able to speak is kind of neat. <laughs> I, it's, uh, I tell seriously, to, to never pick a restaurant and always get the bill. <laughs> So, uh, but, but, but I will say this, the thing that I enjoy most about it uh, is the people. Uh, the relationships that I, that I meet, the breakfasts and when we visit around the table just as we were a few minutes ago, it's the people. It's the people that make this country great. And uh, that's the thing that I enjoy most. My colleagues, uh, I really, really have made friendships I think that will last uh, for the rest of my life. On some of the things that we've really uh, worked hard, um, at the, kind of a, the short term, um, a few months ago, my classmates, uh, several of them here, uh, elected me uh, to be their representative, their sophomore class representative at the leadership table. So uh, it is a humbling opportunity to be able to represent my class and be a conduit uh, to communicate from them to the leadership and from the leadership back to our class. Uh, and one of the things that I think we had to deal with and still have to deal with is the brutal reality that uh, if we are not unified as a conference, we will be destroyed. And we are work. We are we are battling with an individual, <clears throat> just about a mile, a little over a mile from here, whose single goal is to destroy us, politically, and to destroy the things that we stand for, which is freedom. And so, what we've got to do is we've got to have a rally cry that we rally around, and we have to be unified. <coughs> and we have to learn how to win. And I would make the argument that we have a moral obligation to learn how to win. And when you talk about moral obligations, it kind of ratchets, it up, ratchets this things up to a higher level. Morally, we must win. Because if we lose, the consequences are devastating. So what we've got to do is we've got to focus on learning how to win. And I'm amazed as you talk to members of our conference, we agree on policy. We agree on our values. We agree on everything. What we've done, though, is sometimes we've gotten in down in the, in the weeds and we've argued over tactics. And we've argued over strategy. I'm amazed as I visited and got to know our classmates. Uh, that, that It's incredible as I was going through the whipping process running for this uh, position that everybody agrees. And I learned that it's tactics. So I think that what you're going to see in the 113th uh, is a, an effort of collaboration to make sure that everyone feels respected. People support that which they help create. So when you hear the speaker talking about uh, regular order and you hear the speaker talking about collaboration, uh, that's really a focus of mine to make sure that everyone in our conference has say, has at least has their opinion shared. And then I really believe because people support that which they help create, we will learn how to win and we will fulfill that moral obligation that we have. Uh, quickly, uh, as you know, we're going to be working, and I'll, I know we'll probably a answer some questions regarding uh, sequestration, uh, and that's kind of the midterm, what we're going to be dealing with the entire 113th Congress, budget, <coughs> sequestration, CR, um, uh, debt ceilings, those are things that uh, are just with us, and uh, we've got to be unified, not just on our values there, but also on our tactics. One of the things that I'm doing, in my final words here, is uh, Steve has given me the opportunity for the second year in a row uh, to, to champion and really go after uh, our anti-poverty initiative. Uh, you see, what, what, one of the things that's going on in this country that I would say is immoral, immoral, is that we are just throwing money after poverty, but we're making no dents in, uh, in, 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 that, in our effort. We have spent $15 trillion since LBJ stood up and said, we are going to launch a, 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 a war on poverty. We have spent $15 trillion, and there's more Americans today, by percentage, living in poverty than were the day he made that statement. 
We can do better. We must do better. And I think that if we don't, then uh, we are guilty of not accomplishing the moral imperative uh, to really give people an opportunity to understand purpose, vision, and uh, in their lives. So thank you again for allowing us to be here. And uh, thank you again, Steve, for your leadership. We look forward to your support. Passion and uh, he's doing great work with the Anti Poverty Initiative and RC. Again, uh, we're, we're actually going to be making a lot of headway addressing the real problems underlying that, uh, that force a lot of money to be wasted, not really address the problem. Uh, next up is our newest member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, somebody who uh, I think if you've heard him speak before, it's always uh, you, you learn a lot and you, you walk away uh, a lot, you know. Feel a lot better about yourself, but uh, somebody who I uh, enjoyed listening to as well from Missouri, Midwest, is uh, Billy Long. Thank you. thank you, and thank you all for the invite to be here this morning. Always trying to get in on all these uh, ripping society meetings that I can, and just say a few quick words about Bob Woodward. I read his book, The Price of Politics. Saw him on the corner out here back in December. He was waiting for a light, I was waiting on a light. I said, Mr. Woodward, I said, I just read your book, Price of Politics. I said, great read, great book. I said, now I can't tell you about the meetings that I wasn't in, but the meetings that I was in that are depicted in your book, it was like you had a tape recorder in the room. I mean, there were verbatim quotes from people and things. So from that, what I told him back in December, now that he's having this dust up with Gene Sperling and who started the sequester, we can only assume that the meetings I was not in at the White House would be just as accurate. <laughs> so I, I don't want to get into a uh, he said, she said, who started the sequester. We know who started it, but uh, the, uh, on Saturday Night Live, I was dozing off. I set it on you know, 30 minutes of the TV to go off, and I was doing out of consciousness, and I'm, <laughs> I'm watching you know, this news conference with the president, and someone from TSA and someone from uh, the Park Service or something. And the lady from TSA said, uh, we're just going to have you take a camera and put it down in the front of your pants and take a picture and send it to us. <laughs> you know, I didn't know if that was real or not. <laughs> I mean, that's how, I was, you know, I was prepared last week for the president to say, starting Friday, starting Friday when this sequester kicks in, every child in this country from now on is going to be born naked. <laughs> the most outlandish things they were saying. I got home. I got home last Friday. Stopped uh, at the airport. A buddy picked me up. Uh, we stopped at Texas Roadhouse to have a bite to eat on the way home. Texas. We, uh, <laughs> Texas Roadkill. Is that what you said? <laughs> stopped at Texas Roadhouse. We're standing there waiting for our table. The lady comes up and says, "We have your table." We start to walk in. A lady is walking out with her little go box of the remnants of her food. And she walks past me and she gives it one of these. It's, aren't you, aren't you, uh, aren't you like somebody, aren't you like a representative or something? And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, let me ask you something. Stand there with her go box. She said, why can't you all in Washington get along? Why can't you get anything done? Why can't you work together up there? I said, well, let me give you a little example. I said, I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm on a subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, and I wanted to give us some Democrats the other day to run by, just swing by their office and talk about an issue. So I told my chief of staff, who's been on the Hill for 16, 17 years, a lot of experience, and my legislative director has been up here longer than that, a lot of experience, worked in the Bush administration, Department of Energy, worked for, they both worked for senators, they both worked for other congressmen before me. And, uh, I said, I told them to set up these meetings. And they came in with their jaw on the floor and they said, you can't believe the reception we're getting. I said, what's that? And they said, when we call their chief and their ladies like, they said, what does Billy want? I said, well, he just wants to swing by and talk to your member, member on member meeting. They said, five years ago, that would have been member on member, no staff, fine. All I want to do is swing by their office and talk. I'm not a bomb thrower. I'm not a bombastic. You will see very, they rate how many times you've spoken on the house floor. I'm probably one of the least minutes on the house floor because that's just not my style my grandmother always told me you catch more flies with honey than you can vinegar and i don't think going out there and just throwing stuff against the other side every day is really the best way to proceed so it's not like here comes this wild-eyed billy long what in the world does he want <laughs> and i'm sitting there looking at this lady with her little go box and I, and I said you know i guess we're too good to talk to each other 
And so they would, they want to know what I wanted. They wanted the full agenda. They wanted to know. They said, well, he's got to have an agenda. They said, no, he just wants to swing by and talk to you. Remember, 10 minutes. But what does he want? We, we need to know, and I, we need an outline of what he wants to talk about while he's here, and we want to know what his agenda is. And she looked at me, and she said, she said, I make $55,000. She said, now I make $21,000. And I looked at her and I, and, you know, and I said, and we can't cut 2.4% off of an ever-increasing budget. Now, what if I, I didn't say this, but what I would like to have said was, what if I would have come to you when you were making $55,000 a couple of years ago and told you you need to take a 2.4% cut? I bet that lady could show us how to cut 2.4% now that she's taking a 65% cut in her pay. A lady friend of mine up here that... Uh, from Virginia, she uh, was in a veterinarian office here a couple of weeks ago, over in Virginia. She's sitting there with her little dog waiting for to get in to see the vet. And she said this guy walks in, and he's in workman's clothes. And he walks up to the lady at the counter and, and says, can I help you? And, and he said, yes, ma'am, I'd like to buy a heartworm medication for my lab. She said, would you like six months or a year, sir? So he kind of lowered his voice and he said, uh, I'm an electrician and I haven't had as much work lately and I just got my truck out of the shop. Is there any way you could just sell me one? You know, that's a hard working American. That's not on the public dole. That's, that's, that's got, he's got his priorities straight. He's going to make sure that his dog gets at least that one heartworm pill for one month. Those are the people that us so-and-sos up here that are too good to talk to each other to try and get this economy going. Bob Lattice said yesterday, said, you know, that if Washington would just get out of the way, the economy would take off. But those are the people that need a voice up there. I mean, there's only been 10,790-some congressmen of all time. Those people can't speak on the House floor. They can't have a, a real voice up here. We're talking about my voice for 751,000 people in my district. But, you know, when I ran two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, I ran on two words and a question mark. I ran on fed up. The front of my sign said Billy Long for Congress. The back of my sign said fed up. People drive down the street, all they'd see is black and white letters. Fed up, question mark. Of course, they'd stop and look, the world is that? <laughs> Brilliant. They were, stealing, they were stealing my sign in southwest Missouri and taking them over and using them in Illinois. <laughs> they didn't know why they had Billy Long for Congress up over there, but they just loved that fed up part. <laughs> Had lunch last Friday at the Village Inn, sitting there talking to two people. This is beside the point. This has nothing to do with the story I'm going to tell you, but one of them's in the insurance business. I said, how's your income? He said, I'm down two-thirds over three years ago. The other guy was a mortgage banker. I said, how's your income? He said, I'm down over half, Billy. I've known these guys forever. They're telling me the truth. That's beside the point. But one of them said, you know what? Your office is really developing a good reputation. I said, how's that? I mean, you don't hear very much good, especially if you read my Facebook. I'm the worst thing in the world. <laughs> but uh, he said, he said you help people. You really help people. He said, your office has developed a reputation for constituent service for helping people. So I leave. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. I leave the village, and I drive back to my office. I get out, and I walk in the office. And I'm like, Where's my phone. Well, Billy, it's probably in your car, plugged into the cigarette lighter, where it always is when you forget it. So, I go back out. I'm getting in the car. It's cold. I start I open the door, and I hear this. Hey, Congressman. When you hear, hey, Congressman, you don't always want to look up. And I'm like, did I not hear that? If I don't hear that, I get my phone, I go back indoors. And uh, so I kind of didn't hear it, and I started reading for my phone. Hey, Congressman! And I look up, a guy in full, long, whatever you call it, trench coat, black, down to the ground coat, stocking hat, not, a, not, not covered in face, <laughs> stocking hat, this long trench coat, whatever you call it. Hey, Congressman! This time he's approaching on the other side of my car. And I, I said, just a minute, i got to get the phone. So I already, already, already had the door open, so I, I gave him the phone out and shut the door. He said, uh, he said, my dad was a World War II vet. And he said, my mom had tried to get her, uh, her benefits 
for 37 months. And he named a senator that shall go unnamed that said, I worked with her office and they just. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did that kind of thing. But uh, she said, I worked with her and she could get nowhere. She got me nothing. He said, I came in your office January the 25th. Now this is February 20th. No, this is March 1st. Today, March 1st. He said, I walked in your office on January the 25th. He said, Mom got her first check today. That's why we do it. They wonder why we fly back and forth every week. And But when you can help people like that. Walked in the Ozark Empire Fair last summer. A guy comes up and says, hey, I want to thank you. And I said, why? He said, I'm a Vietnam vet. He said, I tried to get my benefits forever and ever and ever. And said, that little Ann in your office, and she finally got my benefits. But... Uh, you know, we just, I mean, I am, I ran on fed up two years ago. I mean, I'm really fed up now. I mean, the fact that, that you can't talk to the other side. Lacey Clay came up to me on the House floor. Hey, Billy, need some tickets to the uh, inauguration. I said, Lacey, I need a ticket to the Kennedy Center Honors for my daughter. I can't get you that. I said, what do you mean you can't get it? It's the president's deal. He's up there with David Letterman and Dustin Hoffman and Led Zeppelin and the Russian ballerina. I said, it's his deal. You can get me it. And I wasn't wanting a free ticket. I, I wanted to buy it, but I just wanted a ticket. Because you can't get them. My, my wife and I already had them. I need one for my daughter. He said, well, I can't get you a ticket. I said, well, why not? He said, Billy, the president doesn't talk to us. He doesn't talk to me. I said, Lacey, that's the problem. I said, he won't talk to you. How do you expect him to talk to the Republicans? And I mean, that, when you've got people that were making 55000 that are now making 21000 you got a guy, an elect, hard-working electrician that wants to buy one pill at a time for his dog, those are the stories that need to be told. Those are the people we need to help. Those are the people we need to get government out of the way. And so that is going to be my, I'm trying to get some floor time tomorrow, and it's hard to get floor time. There's what you call special orders. A lot of people like to go down there every night and do special orders, and they take up the calendar sometimes, and so, uh, but thankfully that I don't talk a lot on the floor, when I do talk, I think I have a little bit of a voice, so, God bless you, thanks for being here, and I'm going to do what I can to try and get a little cooperation going for people. Thank you, Billy. Uh, that cleanup for us is uh, one, of our, uh, one of our members of the Appropriations Committee who's really come in, and I think kind of started to change that culture. He was the, uh, the head of the Appropriations Committee in the State Senate in Mississippi, and he was the guy when, you know, in states where they actually have to balance their budgets, he was the guy who, you know, when everybody had their great ideas how to spend more money in Mississippi and they, they had hit their balance, he was the one who said, look, this is it. We, uh, you know, we're balancing this budget and we're making the tough decisions. Uh, so not only is he a great friend, his wife Tori comes up here a lot, and she's wonderful too, uh, but he represents the birthplace of the king, Tupelo, Mississippi. So uh, with that, my good friend Alan Nunley. Steve, I don't know what I did, but you put me following really long. <laughs> Real briefly about, about my background, uh, I served in the state senate <coughs> uh, our district had, had a Democrat incumbent, and people were calling wanting me to run, and my answer was no. I was not remotely interested in coming up here for three primary reasons. First of all, as Steve said, I chair the Appropriation Budget Committee in our state level. It's a job a lot of people seem to think is pretty important, and I was enjoying it. Uh, secondly, I had started a business with my dad. Now, we <coughs> did not succeed as rapidly as Bill Forrest's business has succeeded, and we had not been in business near as long as Steve Sutherland's family had been in business. Uh, but I had gone for the first two years without taking a paycheck. We'd been in business about 15 years, and we, we were starting to make some money. I was enjoying the, the, the fruits of my labor. And then the third issue, maybe the most important, my youngest child started college, I had three children, my youngest child was in college, with Smith. I had the opportunity to date my bride again. And so my life was good, people wanted me to run for Congress, my answer was no. All of that changed March the 27th, 2009. Uh, I know the day, because that's my wife's birthday. And on that day, my son and my oldest son and my daughter-in-law came to see us tell us we were going to be first-time grandparents. 
And I know it sounds corny, uh, but as, as my friend Haley Barber says, and he got it from Ronald Reagan, Haley says it has the added advantage of being the truth. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> the next morning, is, is I've got a three-hour drive to the state capitol, and I'm driving myself, and I was making all of the arguments as to why I did not want to run for Congress. And all of those arguments have made so much sense two weeks before. And now, in view of the fact that I'm going to be a granddaddy, those arguments began to sound very selfish. Because what I saw happening in D.C. was the country that I love, the country that had grown up and given me the opportunity to be the first one in my family to attend college, to start a business, to begin to, to make money. I felt all of that freedom and opportunity was slipping away. And I felt I had an obligation to do something about it. So here I am. Now, it's an honor to speak to you today, and I'm here primarily to support my friend Steve Scalise. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were in a meeting of the Republican Conference, and I had one of those aha moments. We were going around talking about why is it we, we, we can't seem to coalesce. It seems like uh, in, you know, in the first two years of the Obama administration, uh, we were able to get together. When, when the stimulus came up, we had 100% of Republicans vote against the stimulus. And then health care came up and we rallied and we only lost one and, and, and we, we all voted against Obamacare and, and that aha moment hit. As Republicans, we are very good at coalescing around what we're against. We can do that all day long. It's tough to figure out what are we for and how do we advance an agenda bringing together the different factions that make up the Republican Party and actually accomplish something as to what we're for. Well, there's been a lot said since the inauguration. But if you look at what's actually been done in Congress since the inauguration, we've had some pretty significant victories. First of all, the United States Senate that has not come up with a budget in four years we put them in a box and said, okay, you're going to come up with a budget this year or you're not, not going to get paid. And they accepted that. They're going to come up with a budget. <laughs> then we dealt with sequestration. Now, I'll be the first person to tell you that sequestration is not the best way to cut spending. But the only thing that would be more dumb then cutting, cutting by sequestration is not cutting spending at all. And we had a legitimate $85 billion spending cut last Friday that went into effect. Now they tried to delay it, they delayed it two months, but it went into effect last Friday. Now, this week, we are actually going to fund that sequestered budget at a reduced amount from what it would have been had Republicans not been at the table. That's what we've accomplished. What's going to happen next week, Bill and I are on the budget committee. Monday, I think you're going to see a press conference and the budget committee is going to unveil the House budget. We're going to begin the process of marking it up and passing it. What I really look forward to is debating with the United States Senate our visions for America. There's really only three ways to deal with our debt. You can ignore it. You can solve it by raising taxes. Or you can solve it by cutting spending. The House plan we're going to come out with will take the third option. We're going to balance our budget within the 10-year budget window without raising taxes. I don't know what the Senate's going to do, but I look forward to having a healthy debate as to our vision for America. And then after that, we're going to deal with the debt ceiling, and I would suggest we'll follow the Boehner principle that whatever we do on the debt ceiling, we're going to cut spending by more than we raise the debt ceiling, by as much or more as we raise the debt ceiling. So I'll make two observations to you about that sequence of events. First of all, we have not done nearly what we would have done had the November elections turned out different if we had a different occupant in the White House, if we had a Republican majority in the United States Senate. 
But given the cards the way we've been dealt, I think we've accomplished something. But the third thing, it's the primary reason I'm here today. I would suggest to you we have accomplished more than we would have done had Steve Scalise not been pressed on the Republican Study Committee and at the table negotiating with Because there's times we've got to be content moving the ball down the field five yards at a clip, eight yards at a clip. Let's rehuddle. Let's look and see who got injured on the last play. Let's, get, let's, let's move forward. Uh, but we're not going to be able to throw an 80 yard pass into the end zone every single play. I would suggest to you that is an excellent strategy for us to pursue during the next two years because our margin is 12 seats. We're only up 12. If we play it wrong, we could have a Nancy Pelosi this speed. And the last two years of this administration will look like the first two years. We cannot allow that to happen. And the only thing standing between President Obama implementing his agenda is the House Republicans. And that has been significantly altered because of the leadership style of Steve Scalise and the privilege of certain. So thank you for uh, the opportunity. And I guess, Mr. Chairman, we'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> really appreciate it. I think you can see from all of our members uh, why the RSC is so influential in, in the operations of the House and what kind of talent we've got uh, as members of the RSC and, uh, and why we've been able to, uh, to get so many of those wins that we're finally starting to get laying out down the road. I know we, uh, we're running behind where we were supposed to be, but I appreciate you all uh, being here. I don't know if yeah, I can wrap it up Do uh, we have any questions? If, if, uh, Mr. Ford, you have uh, the first question if you have. If you we'll get it. Well, you're talking about, um, you talked last about the budget and the, the, the announcement y'all going to make next week about balancing within 10. Story in the Post this morning, Republicans getting nervous that in order to balance within 10, you're going to have to start um, taking uh, Medicare uh, away from people as young as 58, or as old as 58. Um, Talk about the politics of a 10-year balance budget. Well, the, first of all, the, let, let me say this about the fiscal situation of the federal government. It's going to get fixed one way or the other. Either our creditors are going to cut us off, or we're going to come up with a plan to convince the creditors to give us a little more time uh, to work through the mess that we've got. Um, <coughs> yes, we are going to have to raise the Medicare eligibility age. Uh, we are also going to have to change what is what Medicare options are available to folks that are some years away from retirement age. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at, well, I need to be careful here what I'm saying. <coughs> this is saying that you know, last year we said if you're 55 and older, you'll get the Medicare that's available to you today. If you're 55 and younger, you'll have a choice of the Medicare today or the, uh, more of a a uh, premium support system, which in our thinking was more people want to go with premium support than want to go with fee for service. So, uh, you know, that, you know, when you compress from balancing in 30 years to 10, something's got to give, and so you'll see some change there. Uh, look, the American people, I think, are pretty smart about the fact that we've got a spending and a debt problem, and I think we put forth a credible solution there and talk about the fact that. Um, we need to do this for their kids and grandkids. I think we get their support. Now, but we're going to get demonized, I guarantee you that. But, but uh, if, if we try to stay on message and, and uh, talk about spending and protecting the future for our country, I think, I think we can win it. We won the Medicare debate, except for one special election. We won the Medicare debate in all the special elections we had last time, and also in the last, in the last cycle we won the Medicare debate. No, I, I think we can win it. Let me follow up with what Bill's saying. You know, the, the last budget cycle, we drew the, the magic line at age 55. And said, okay, anybody uh, over age 55 is not going to change. I don't know where the age is going to fall out. My guess is it will not be as high as 58. But I do think there is value in saying, okay, we delayed last year. The problem is not getting better. So it was 55. Those people that were 55 last year are a year older. Uh, and so what that allows us to do is communicate to the American people, look, if we delay two more years, that number's going to continue to change. And uh, 
The Medicare actuaries have said Medicare's not going to be able to pay claims in a decade. But we've got to do it. Thank you. Nancy. <coughs> this is very, very refreshing, and I appreciate all of you uh, coming and giving us a little of your background and where you stand and what you're thinking and what you're accomplishing. And what you're doing is extremely important. And I, as a Northeast Republican, agree with that. But I was elected in a hometown in which every, if every Republican and every Independent voted for you, you lost two to one. And I was their state senator for six years, and I was their congressman for 24. Now, if we don't do something within our party to be consistently in accord with conservative principles, we will lose not only legal, but increasingly the Midwest. As bedrock, as all the principles you're talking about in comic which I agree with, absolutely, there wasn't a thing you said here that I didn't agree with. And when Newt was, before Newt was speaker, I and the other co-chairman of the, what's now the Tuesday group, and the, what's now the conservative group, would meet every Wednesday morning at 7, before anything else started, to think about what are the issues that we all agree on, so we can focus on where the party is unified. And I would, I would like you to think about it, and I would love to talk to you some kind of great thing about why religious freedom is bedrock in America. And the Republican Party is in trouble because it isn't dealing with the challenge that religious freedom issues of conscience differ with America. We're losing my children. They're good Republicans. I don't want them to lose them because they're also good Unitarians that believe that God speaks to us in many different ways. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but you're pushing good Republicans out of the party just when the nation, really, the nation's future is at risk if we can't maintain the majority and, and sail stronger you know, in this country. So I'd love to talk to you about how I worked with my pro-life people and why they so strongly supported me and uh, so the both of them. <laughs> um, I hate to do this, but I, you just got the hook. You guys have conference. So please join me in thanking our, our gentleman for being here this morning.